Since the advent of generative AI, the landscape of communications is undergoing a seismic shift and it's reshaping the way organisations such as ourselves manage their reputations, communicate with stakeholders and engage with the public. Companies like OpenAI and Google have shown how advanced algorithms and vast data sets can produce high quality text, images and even videos. So James, apparently AI can generate drafts for press releases and write a crisis plan and even partake in conversations with stakeholders. But should we use it for that? Or is it time for us just to let the robots take over? <laughs> I don't think we're quite there yet with uh, the robots taking over, but it's probably not far away. And there's communicators, um, people working in public relations, marketing, you know, the possibilities are endless. And no doubt people are getting pretty sick of going to conferences and reading blogs and hearing in the news about the onslaught of AI and how it's going to revolutionise work and that kind of thing. It, I mean, the short answer is yes, it will. But I think we need to really think through and carefully approach how it should revolutionise our our day-to-day work in the comms and marketing space because, you know, we've started trialling it here at Banksia and um, particularly focused on initially ChatGPT but now we're sort of more focused on Microsoft Copilot um, for reasons we can discuss in a minute. Um, But I think what we've seen from the initial trials is that for us it um, it can take – so much the burden of the initial admin work of putting press releases together, um, email lists, um, first drafts of reports, doing research. It can like really shave a huge amount of time um, in getting that grunt work done. But you need to be really careful about using it for your end communications. So the communications that go to customers, to clients, to key stakeholders. And I think th- there's a few key reasons for that. One, we all know that you can't completely rely on the data. <laughs> but I think that the other thing for communicators that we really need to be on top of is that if you're just using, if you're using AI to write the end copy that goes to customers, that goes to the market, that goes to media, then we run this risk of everyone in the world sounding exactly the same. And because that that's, that is how AI will learn. It takes in all the information around the world. People ask it the same prompt, write me a media release, write me some key messages, it will think it will take all the research that it's got, all the data points that it's got, and come up with the one style that it thinks works best. And then everyone will keep using that style. And if everyone's using the same language, the same approach, the same style, then we're all going to sound the same. And we're not going to get that cut through to the customers or the decision makers or the key stakeholders that we're trying to get cut through with. So that's where communicators and marketers, PRs, still have a really critical job of using their creativity, using their intelligence, um, using their experience on how to take a bit of information that AI can um, help prepare and help draft, but then turn it into something creative, turn it into something that's going to cut through the noise. And that's that's probably the initial uh, learning from a communicator that, that I would take out in, in using AI in the workplace. And it's an interesting um, little quadrant I found in doing some research for today's episode around what jobs would we expect to be taken by AI and what jobs do we think will survive, but also grading them on two axes. So one axis was how social is that job and the other axis was is the job optimization based or is the job strategy or creativity based? And so... You know, no surprises for us. We after your just conversation there, it's like I don't think commu- strategic communicators are getting replaced anytime by by AI, especially because of that strategy, but also because of that human factor. And I think that's most important part is that I don't think even if it could happen, I don't think anyone's gonna be very receptive to knowingly talking to a robot all the time, or knowingly talking to just a language model that is ra- like for all intents and purposes being randomly generating words that look and feel like the formula that makes the thing that they're trying to make. So having that human aspect, even if it was, you know, way more efficient, way cheaper, currently it's neither of those two things. I just don't see it taking off for those purposes. So I'd ask the same question then of content, um, particularly I I think it's probably more relevant to journalism Mm. and we've seen some papers now starting to use AI uh, to generate news stories. Can the same question then still be asked like are humans and readers going to be as interested in reading a news story online and or in a paper if it's been written by ai as opposed to a human journalist i think that's interesting in the sense that what are you reading it for but it could replace sort of generic 
news items that we currently consume from time to time just for information gathering. Mm. And how do that – do you know how um, news outlets are approaching generating that content? Like does that have any implications then for people working in communications and PR as to how they submit information that they want to be covered in a news story that might be written by AI? I think – if it needs to be covered by AI, it kind of just needs to be formulaic, like more like an Excel spreadsheet than you would for like an actual story. You're not pitching up the, the pitch, you're pitching up just the information. Using Spoil as an example where sometimes it is just like, here's the score, here's key, who kicks the goals. You will just submit the Excel spreadsheet of the stats of the game, give it to AI, and the AI will say, this game was played on Sunday, it was between Team Y, Team X, player A kicked three goals, end of article. And that, I think, is a fair use of, of AI. So it's probably something for communicators to consider then. Mm. Like, are you optimising your press releases, your media alerts and whatnot so that – obviously optimised for humans to be able to read yeah. it and consume it and journalists to read it and consume it and use it, um, sure. But are there other tweaks that we need to start um, thinking about in the format and the style, even right down to the, the file type that we use – to make it easier for everything from Google search, which we know is an, an SEO is so important, uh, through to any types of AI models, gen AI models that are out there to make it easier for them to pick up and un- and use our messaging and our story that we're trying to put forward. I don't have the answer to that, but I think that's certainly worthwhile communicators having to look at. Absolutely. The other angle I had here too was um, there's been some toing and froing around the use of AI in crisis communications. Given that in your in previous episodes we've talked about how crisis communications, not one, basically the number one aspect of that is earnestly communicating with your stakeholders. Is there any benefit to using AI in that process, considering like it could just be amplification or does it need to feel human to work appropriately and properly? There is a role, I think, for AI to play in crisis management response because – particularly the way that we approach crisis management and crisis response here at Banksia, it is based in tried and tested theory. It's based in formulas. It's based in best practice models and matrices. Basically, we take the guesswork out of responding to a crisis because there are these formulas. um, There is this theory that you can follow that will more often than not lead you to developing the right content and delivering it to the right person at the right time if you follow those formulas. So essentially, and we've been sort of exploring this, how can we plug that knowledge and those frameworks and those matrices into an AI model that then can, as I would be following as a human, when I go along and sit in the boardroom when there's a crisis, could I get AI to do that if prompted to use all all these best practice models that we've got and spit out a recommendation I think the answer is yes, and it can help with that initial work. And probably one of the benefits of that is I've seen so often uh, in a crisis management team, um, when your company's reputation's on the line, when something's gone wrong, there is a lot of emotion involved. And when there's emotion involved and people are under stress and it's a high pressure environment, humans make mistakes. That's one of the beautiful things about being humans is we make mistakes. And it is important in that crisis space that we do try and take the pride out of it. We do try and take the emotion out of it and we just follow tried and tested plans because that will ultimately give us probably a a better chance of of resolving it and coming out the other side. So yes, I think there's an opportunity for AI to play a role in that initial work, but the key to managing that trust long-term with your clients and to getting the communication and the narrative right is it's still got to have that human touch before it goes out. So yes, you can help it build the initial draft and make sure you've ticked all the right boxes, you've followed best practice, but there's going to be some contextual information about the human element, the, the human narrative to the effect and the emotion that your audience are currently feeling that AI is not going to, at this stage, maybe in the future, but at this stage, they're probably not going to be across that. And you might need to tweak the messaging based on your gut feel at that end, that final hurdle. But I could have a lot of that initial grunt work and sort of check check box stuff done a lot quicker if I had an AI bot to do that. I suppose the other danger here is that we often we talk about AI as this, this entity, this like, 
like it's another species, like it's a like it's a solo self perpetuating growth. And it's not. It is it is technology run by for profit organizations. It's run exactly for that, for commercial benefit. And there's a handful of people who get to make really important decisions about where these technologies go, how they are advanced, what information they're based on. And all that comes with bias and imperfection and commercial restrictions and all these sorts of things. Are these the kind of factors we should be considering as businesses, as individuals, as campaign managers, whatever we're doing in communications, when we engage in AI? Is to should we always be cognizant of the fact that it's not this like this evergreen tool with no bias, but in fact it's just another commercial tool. It's no different to using a web browser. It's no different to using email. It's no different to using a computer. Someone's getting something out of it as much as we are. Yeah, absolutely. It's just another piece of technology. It's not taking over. And, and I think what Microsoft have done, which is really clever, is they've called their AI co-pilot, not autopilot. Very deliberate. It's not there to do your job. It's not there to take over. It's there to help as a co-pilot. So you you still have the steering wheel. Mm. The you know the buck still stops with you. You've just got a, a support there now. So I think that's that's really important to remember. And I, I think because these models have been built um, to your point, Gordon, by you know for profit businesses enterprises, you know we have to be really careful about the results that it comes up with. Mm. Um, we do have to poke and prod and make sure that it is one that it's factual and two that it is uh, being sourced ethically and that's where I think you know we start to get into the some of the things that businesses um, need to and agencies need to be thinking about today in their use of AI I think one you know there's all these security and privacy and confidentiality and ethical issues about the use of AI in the workplace so they need to look at this now if they haven't already and get a policy together and get an actual strategic approach together for the business and two they need to accept that their employees whether or not they have a policy in place their employees are using it and all the data that's come through all the surveys of employees around the world but particularly in Australia shows that people are using it whether or not they're allowed to in the workplace and they call it sort of shadow AI use. So I think you need to accept that and they will continue to use it regardless of what policy you've got. So one, accept that fact and then two, okay, how can we wrap that into the security and the privacy and the ethical bias considerations that we need to as a business to wrap, to wrap that use with that sort of um, process and system to help protect it, both to help protect the business, to protect our clients, but also to protect our employees. And if you have not done that yet as a business, you should be doing that tomorrow. Well, it's a great place to round off there, some great learnings as well. And I think, you know, I, we, we both would I've openly admit as early adopters of technology, I think, and that's not the case for everyone in the industry but i think it's a case of in terms of generative ai there's absolutely a need to be aware but not alarmed the robots aren't coming to come and take your jobs if anything it will just separate when we waste so much of our time not being human and allow more of our time to actually be human and then that humanity will be your key point whether it's in relationships or in business or in sport or whatever it is that your ability to be more human because you don't have to waste so much time being a machine is where all of your efficiency but also all of your productivity and all your creativity will come from. So I'm fully excited to see what's happening, but um, I'm also very aware of the things that could go wrong. So watch this space.